It was at the end of the great historical debate in the Royal Albert Hall, London, on the 7th of July, 1985, between Professor Floyd E. Clark of the United States of America and Mr. Ahmed Didat of South Africa, that Dr. Soros confronted Mr. Didat for the first time during the question and answer session at the aforementioned meeting on the subject, Was Christ Crucified? This liberated Palestinian, now a citizen of the United States, well-spoken and immaculately dressed, was easily mistaken for a Pakistani. Now, listen to his well-articulated English and still more eloquent Arabic at question time and Mr. Didat's reply. I would like to say that I'm grateful for this opportunity and my questions are actually two. Number one, if the Quran is indeed from God, does it contradict itself in as much as it says, okay. mm -hmm. Therefore, Jesus was born, he died, and he rose again. The second question, if God... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The rules, the rules of the game is to ask one question and get the back so that other people will have a chance. Right. Thank you. Now, the question is directed to Mr. Didat. Mr. Right. Didat. Thank you. The verse in question is Wassalamu alayya yawma wulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma ubasu hayya which translated means so peace is on me the day that I was born the day that I die and the day that I shall be raised to life again the day that I die it is not the day that I died it's not died it's in the future Mr. Didat did not know during his lecture tour of Britain that he was being followed Subsequently, at the end of one of his lectures in the City Hall of Birmingham, during question time, which is one of the regular features at every lecture of Mr. Didat, Dr. Soros came forward to challenge Mr. Didat to a public debate. Fortunately, in this advanced electronic age, we were able to capture Dr. Soros on video to reproduce for you this historical record. I greet you in love and respect. You have spoken eloquently and forcefully, but I want to challenge you anywhere in the world to meet me and debate any topic you get with, because you have given these people, whom I respect as knowledgeable people, misinformation, and as an Arab, I take great pride in saying that our great prophet is a great man indeed. But my question is, following the chairman's suggestion, is would you be willing to meet with me, sir, anywhere in the world? Well, if you've got any questions, give this me is the question. question. This is the question. Uh, brother, if you will just identify yourself as to who you are. A Palestinian Arab who is one of 10 million Arabs who claim the Christian faith as their faith and are proud to say that Islam is a reality, a branch of the Christian faith and a sect, not a religion of itself. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, dear brother, I still haven't got the name, it doesn't matter. Anis. Anis, Anis. Sounds more Pakistani in name, Anis. Harada. Brother Anis, I accept your challenge. And I'm giving you a blank check to hire the Royal Albert Hall. On the subject, you can choose, I give them to you. We have already discussed the crucifixion. And we don't want to bore the people with the same thing again and again. You can choose subject like, is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? Because I know the Christian, I don't know whether you are one of those, but the Christians as a whole, they believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. Is Jesus God, or is the Bible God's word, or the truth about Trinity, or Jesus man myth of God? It's all being recorded. I think we can get a, a, a tape of that. I said, is Jesus God, or is the Bible God's word, or the truth about Trinity, or the Jesus man myth of God? No, no. 
Then all of them, then you do, who book the hall for four or five days consecutively. No, no. It is you, my brother, you challenge me. You see, I paid for the Royal Albert Hall. An American, he was gentleman enough, he was gentleman enough to have a dialogue with me. For that, because I suggested to him, I paid for the hall, I advertised, much, 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 much. Thank you very much. Right. Now, if I can have that in writing from you, before you go away from the hall, I would like to have this in writing from you, your name, address, and where you are, and then I can give you a date, you know, give you a date, any date that suits you in September, in September, or after you have to go after winter. September because Beautiful. So you hire a hall and you tell me I'll make it my duty dead or alive to be there. Dead or alive, I'll be there. Note that during Mr. Didat's acceptance of the Christian's challenge, Mr. Didat had mistaken Dr. Sarosh for a Pakistani. During the interchange of words in Birmingham, no connection was established between the challenger and the questioner of the Royal Albert Hall. Had it not been for the gift of this electronic wizard, the video, all the historical exchanges would have been lost to posterity. And without this audiovisual recording, we would never have been sure that the questioner of the Royal Albert Hall on the 7th of July and the challenger on the 15th of July were one and the same person. While still in the UK in July 1985, the topic for the debate, that is, is Jesus God, and the format and the tentative date were finalized between Dr. Sarosh and Mr. Didet. But in a letter dated the 14th of August 1985, Dr. Sarosh changed the subject and also invented a new format. I quote, Point three. The topic is, is Christ indeed the Son of God? Point four, part three. First speaker, Mr. Ahmed Didat, 50 minutes. Point four, second speaker, Mr. Anas Sarosh, 50 minutes. Point five, second rebuttal, Mr. Didat, 10 minutes. Point six, second rebuttal, Dr. Sarosh, 10 minutes. Point seven, final remarks, Mr. Didat, 5 minutes. Point eight, final remarks, Dr. Sarosh, five minutes. On the 1st of September, Mr. Didat took Dr. Sarosh to task for going back on his word. And I quote, I hope you receive my telegram of even date. I regret very much your changing of the subject from Is Jesus God to an insipid topic like Is Christ indeed the Son of God? Topic. We debated this subject while both of us were in the UK, and we'd settled for Is Jesus God? A hard-hitting, succinct, potent, and dynamic topic in contrast with your Is Christ indeed the Son of God? Why don't you believe that Jesus is God? If you don't, then we will change the subject. But you had agreed. Are you getting cold feet? You know that your format is patently unjust. Why not leave the format as agreed? In other words, that the first speaker, whoever he is, speak for 50 minutes, and the second speaker for 60 minutes, followed by the first speaker, who will have the final 10 minutes, same as between me and Dr. Clark. To appear just and fair, the chairman will toss a coin in front of the audience. You were absolutely tickled by this suggestion of mine on the phone. Have you forgotten this also? On the 18th of September 1985, Dr. Sarosh finally agreed to the original subject to be debated. But he leaves the format in the air. As late as November the 15th, an unjust format is still being stubbornly mooted by Dr. Sarosh. And again I quote, 50 minutes first speaker, 50 minutes second speaker, 8 minutes rebuttals first speaker, 8 minutes rebuttals second speaker. Up to 15 minutes before the start of the great debate, the format was still unsettled. Mr. Didat unwillingly agreed to the unjust format of Dr. Sarosh, 
leaving everything to Allah and the tossing of the coin. Dr. Sarosh lost the toss, and the outcome of the debate we leave to you, the intelligent viewer, to decide. We have a notice. Between one and two thousand people were unable to get in here tonight, and therefore they were reluctantly turned away by the police on the instruction of the authorities here because there was no room. In a debate of this nature, it's important that we understand the character of the meeting that we've come to. And I believe this is a historic occasion where those who come from a Christian perspective can listen to those who come from an Islamic perspective and vice versa. And I speak as chairman of this meeting. I am a committed Christian. My name is Clive Calver and I'm General Secretary of the Evangelical Alliance. For the purpose of this meeting, I will remain totally impartial and will seek to act in true British fashion as a neutral. We'll endeavour to do so for the next two and a half hours. I do want to welcome you on behalf of both our participants who are thrilled that this hall is so full tonight. It's good that you've taken the time to come to this important occasion. You may be wondering when you yourselves would have an opportunity in participating in this debate. And after our two main speakers have delivered their initial address, there will be an opportunity for you to write down any question that you may wish to have answered on a piece of paper, and then the stewards will collect it and will bring it down here in order that it may be drawn impartially from a bin containing all the questions that we receive. And with whatever time we have left, such questions as can be answered will be answered. There are certain rules governing this debate. We would like to request that there be no cheering, that there be no overt partisan activities, no waving of banners or anything similar, and no chanting. That is because we believe this is an opportunity to learn and to hear, not just to shout for our uh, respective positions. After the main speaker has spoken, you may greet his contribution from both sides with polite applause, which will not be extended. And we would ask you to observe that, and we would ask that those from both perspectives applaud both speakers. We are grateful to them for giving their time and their energies in coming to share in this important debate. There is one other thing that needs to be stated very firmly. Once you are in your seats, we request that you do not leave your seats unless it is absolutely essential. We would ask that you do not move up the aisles, and we would ask that in no way do you ever attempt to break through the extensive security cordon to come onto the platform. That would not be in order or fitting as part of this debate, and we would ask you just to observe those few limitations. What I would like to do at this point in time is to introduce our two speakers to you. As I've said already, we're thrilled that they're here for this vital debate. And I'm going to ask Mr. Ahmed Thompson if he would just briefly introduce Mr. Didat to us all. Thank you. Good evening. Bismillah. Mr. Ahmed Didat is probably well known to many of you already. He's been in England several times before and was here at the Albert Hall in July and, and last summer in another similar debate to this. He's the director of the Islamic Propagation Center in Durban in South Africa. And he's a man who has studied both the Quran and the Bible for a considerable length of time. Obviously, as a Muslim, he accepts the Quran as the final revelation from God to man to the last of the prophets and much of his perspective is based on what is in the Quran. He is also interested in the Bible though, which although it does not contain the original Gospel of Jesus in the original Aramaic, is nevertheless still an interesting document. 
And perhaps we should just draw your attention to one of the verses of Quran, which says, and the sayings is addressed primarily to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah on him, but also to all Muslims. And it says, if anyone disputes with you, after the knowledge which has come to you, this is the knowledge in the Quran, then say to them, bring your sons and your women folk and yourselves and ourselves together and let us pray to Allah, let us pray to God. May the curse of God be on us if we are lying. So on behalf of Mr. Didat and of all the Muslims, I would just like to say that as far as the knowledge which he refers to from the Quran, may the curse of Allah be on us if it is not true. Thank you. We're pleased to also have on the platform the Reverend Fred Masabmi uh, from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, he's a missionary at large and he's come uh, as Mr. Shirosh's companion tonight. A word or two of introduction to Anis Shirosh. Anis is uh, a Palestinian, he became a refugee in 1948 in Jordan. He went to the USA and studied in Mississippi where he received the degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Divinity. He is married with four children, three boys and a girl, and has worked as a Christian evangelist since 1966. He lives in Mobile, Alabama, and possesses a further degree in the Doctorate of Ministries. And Anise is warmly welcome here tonight as well, having made the trip across the Atlantic. Before we toss the coin, this is the moment where we introduce the threats. Should anybody get really carried away, they will be carried away. <laughs> this will not be done by either a Christian or a Muslim, it will be done by both. Because we are thrilled that the stewarding of this event is a cooperative venture as well. And so please would you observe the regulations, do not exceed what we have said, do not attempt to come to the platform in any form, and please restrain yourselves. You may well hear things tonight that will be offensive to you from whichever position you may come. That, without being taken too far, is in the nature of the debate. We would urge you to accept that and recognize that the best testimony you can give for whichever position of faith you take will be seen in conduct, not in words. And however much you may wish to make a point in words, the attitude and conduct that we all have towards each other tonight will show far more of our faith than any words we might use. So let us act in courtesy and in gentle cooperation together tonight. That's going to be the spirit of this debate. That's the way we're going to handle it. And if there is any need for any interjection, then I will come to this microphone and we'll make an interjection. In a few moments, both our speakers are going to speak to us. They will speak for 50 minutes each. I will gently touch them on the elbow when they have two minutes left, two minutes left. If they don't finish on time, I will stand up and place a brotherly arm around their shoulder and encourage them to sit down, but I'm sure that won't be necessary. We're going to be very democratic about this. We're going to spin a coin to see who goes first. I'm going to ask Mr. Ahmed Thompson if he'll spin the coin. He has one in his hand. I'm going to ask Anish Sharosh if he'll call in the air and we'll see what happens. Anise has called heads, which will give him the choice if he is correct of who goes first. If it is tails, Mr. Didat will have the choice of who goes first. It's tails, Mr. Didat, you have the choice. Mr. Sharosh goes first. Thank you very much. أنني أحييكم جميعاً باسم يسوع الناصري وابن بلدي 
I greet you tonight in the name of Jesus the Nazarene, the man from my hometown. In the city of Nazareth, we are taught, never go see a friend empty-handed. And tonight, I take great pleasure in presenting my friend, whom I'm meeting personally for the first time, Mr. Didat, with a present. I also like to present our chairman of the deacons, a special present, and this is the key to our city of Mobile, Alabama, which is presented to people who contribute much, not only to our great city, but to others as well. And to all the colleagues of my friend, Mr. Didat, I have a special Bible marker from the holy city of Jerusalem with a picture of the Dome of the Rock and other sites. All will receive one. You can pass it to I believe that many of you have been sitting here for a while. Some have traveled a long distance. It is time for you to rise for a few moments. Would you please stand up with me, everyone? And as you stand, I'd like to share with you a practice that I do. I read my Bible in my native language of Arabic on my knees, and I read it standing in public as a symbol of respect and reverence. For those of you who brought your Bible, like Mr. Dirac suggested in his announcements and advertisement, you may wish to turn to Hebrews chapter 1, please. Hebrews chapter 1, we read only the first eight <coughs> verses. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has inherited, obtained more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him and of the angels he says who makes his angels spirits and his ministers flame of fire but to the son he says your throne O god is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom thank you and be seated please the distinguished governor of ancient Palestine, Pontius Pilate stood on a balcony overlooking a crowd gathered in the courtyard at the Antonia Fortress in Jerusalem, where I lived before I moved away. He asked the restless crowd a very serious question. What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? Tonight, 1952 years later, and ever since that historic event, the eternal destiny of every human soul depends on how he answers this question. The answer of the crowd on that early morning in Jerusalem was crucify him. The reason which they gave to Pilate, according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Dreading a serious uprising, faced by the jealous religious leaders 
and seeking to please the demanding crowd, the governor succumbed in spite of his forthright declaration three times, I find no fault in him. Six centuries later, the Quran also calls him Zakian, faultless, sinless. I ask you tonight, was Jesus of Nazareth a liar, a lunatic, or Lord as he claimed he was? Creation, conscience, and history substantiates the existence of God. Religions are man's effort, serious effort, at finding God. So say the philosophers, theologians, historians. But wait a moment. I want to ask you a question. Is God really lost for us to look for him and find him? Is it not we who are lost and therefore he comes to seek us? That is why he, through Christ, come looking for you and me. Once again, to impress your intelligent minds, I read from the Bible, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Walakin, in kana in jiluna maktuman, فإنما هو مكتوم في الهالكين الذين فيهم إلى هذا الدهر قد أعمى أذهان غير المؤمنين لألا تعطى لهم إنارة إنجيل مجد المسيح الذي هو سورة الله The Bible is the most extraordinary book in the world The divine library is made of 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 writers, some were kings, some were poor, some were rich, some were old, some were young, some were shepherds, some were fishermen. Yet it shows itself as the inspired, inerrant word of God because the author is one, the Holy Spirit of the living God. I read to you from Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Alimin hadha awalan, anna kulla nubuwwat al-kitab laysat min tafsirin khas. Lannahu lam ta'ti nubuwwatun faqat bi mashiyat insan, bal takallama unsan, unas Allah al-Qiddisun masuqeen, Men are Ruh al Qudus. We know that the Bible is inspired because of the fulfillment of prophecies uttered centuries before the events ever took place. It has influenced the uplifting of human society whenever it has been believed and practiced. Furthermore, the Bible's accuracy has been challenged but never proven. Its accuracy has been substantiated by historical documents, archaeological finds, and ancient manuscripts. Right now, there are over 25,000 copies of the scripture available, some of them at the Great British Museum, for you to check out the accuracy of the Word of God. For instance, Codex Alexandrinus dates back to 350 AD. Codex Vaticanus to 325 AD. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which cover the entire Old Testament, go back to 2,250 years ago. Some of you are well informed about the fantastic discoveries of you, Garrett, of 30 years ago in Syria, and of 10 years ago in the great city of Ibla, in which an entire civilization has been on earth. Both have increased our faith in biblical authority and divine inspiration. Jesus, our Lord himself, who never told a lie, said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall stand forever. 
السماء والأرض تزولان ولكن كلامي لا يزول Listen to the warning at the end of the Bible in Revelation 22:18 through 19. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. The God which the Bible reveals to us is one God. My dear brothers, sisters, precious friends, there is only one God. One God. Yet, unfathomable as it is to our limited mentality, mysterious as it is to our understanding, this one true God Despite every unbeliever's rejection, atheist, agnostic, and whatever, presents himself as a triune God. It is not my discovery. No, it is his own revelation of himself in nature, the Bible, and other ways. Let me emphasize that I humbly, tonight, seek to understand this mystery as much as you do and confess to both of our limitations. Nevertheless, let us please look at examples from nature in which God provides some evidence of the Trinity. We have the elements. How many? Three. Solids, gases, liquids. All matter comes from those three. The air we breathe is also three atoms, one oxygen, one hydrogen, one nitrogen, but it is the air. Water is normally liquid, but frozen it becomes ice, and boiled becomes gas or steam, the same substance, yet three forms. Look at the sun, 93 million miles away. It's warm, it's light, it's heat comes to us, yet it is one sun. Time is divided into past, present, future. Man himself is spirit, mind, and body. Even the family is made up of father, mother, and children. From the very first verses in the Bible, the Trinity is revealed for anyone to see. If you have your Bible, you may wish to look at that. We discover, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Here is God, the Creator. The Heavenly Father. In verse 2, we discover God, the Spirit. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Then we are told in verse 3, Then God said, Let there be light. Here in plain language, in the spoken word of God, is the spoken word of God, the speech of God, if you please, the word of God. Centuries later, we hear the echo of this very truth. In the Gospel of John, where we are told, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. في البدء كان الكلمة, والكلمة كان عند الله, وكان الكلمة الله. The Word, as a person, becomes obvious in verse 2, where we are told, He, yes, the Word He, He was in the beginning with God. هذا كان في البدء عند الله. Once again, we marvel at the revelation of the Trinity in the same first chapter of Genesis. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Verse 26. I urge you to tell me, please, was God discussing the making of the crown of his creation with himself? In other words, was he talking to himself? Or was he talking to someone else? within this mighty trinity we call God. Indeed, the other two persons within the trinity. Notice the scripture. Our image, our likeness, let us. Three clear cut pronouns. Moving to verse 27, we are astonished again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The mystery is unveiled. 
as we see three pronouns, but not the plural as the above. They are now singular. Yes, one God, no doubt about it. Yet three persons, a blessed trinity. In Genesis 3, 22, this truth is brought up again. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. In the book of beginnings, chapter 11, verse 7, we are informed of this mystery once again. When men were building the Tower of Babel, come, God says, let us go down and there confuse their language. Once again, I ask you, was God talking to himself? If so, why does he say, come, let me go down? In the awesome vision of Isaiah, in the awesome vision of Isaiah, in chapter 6, we are the angel's proclamation in verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Diligent listeners, can you explain to me why holy is repeated three times? Why not two or four or more? Is God, the Spirit, the Word are getting clearer to you? Additionally, in verse 8, makes the Trinity ever more clear. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Did you catch it? I send, go for us. The us is the I, the I is the us. Many of you know Arabic. Although Arabic, some of us say, is my mother's tongue. Actually, it's my tongue. My mother still has her tongue. I've got my tongue. But, listen to this. Our verbs, like in all the semantic languages, present a different concept in dealing with grammar. We have the Old Testament in Hebrew, much like Arabic. We have a singular verb, a dual verb, and then three or more. Take, for instance, our word akel. That's a singular, it means he ate. Akala, that's two. Ate. Akalu, that's three who ate. Therefore, in all the Semitic languages, the verb frequently identifies the number of persons involved in the action. You in English can refer to one, two, or a million, but not so in Arabic or Hebrew. Even the word Elohim is a plural word, which is the name of God in Hebrew. Heaven is Shama. In Genesis 1.1, we read the word Shamayim, which is a plural meaning heavens. Did it ever occur to you why God revealed himself in this triune manner? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In the book of Numbers, chapter 6, Verse 24 and 26. The instructions are given for the Aaronic blessing. Why is it a Trinitarian blessing if God is only one? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. From the Christmas story, according to Dr. Luke, Chapter 2, verse 13, we recognize the one triune God again. Glory to God in the highest, the angel sang. He is in the highest. And on earth, peace. Everybody sing about that at this time of the year around the world. According to Isaiah 9, 6, one of the titles of Jesus is Prince of Peace. The angels were announcing the embodiment of peace in Bethlehem. Thirdly, we see the spirit of joy, goodwill towards men. The Trinity is depicted powerfully during the baptism of Jesus. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Not only at the birth of Jesus and the beginning of his public ministry, but also towards the end, the Trinity is clearly demonstrated. 
on Mount Tabor, a short distance from my hometown of Nazareth, at the Transfiguration, God's Spirit is seen as a cloud, and God the Father proclaims, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. هذا هو ابن الحبيب الذي به سررت له اسمعوا ما أسك to explain to me dear friends the frequency of the figure three if it did not point to the trinity in these incidents the Lord Jesus performed three miracles of catching fish in Galilee he raised three people from the dead a girl a youth and an adult to show his love for all ages Three times Peter denied his Lord. Later, three times Peter declared his love for his Lord. Three disciples were witnesses of his transfiguration. Three years he ministered in our world. He was one of three crucified on that date, one because of sin, one in sin, and he for sin. Then he rose on the third day. Can you deny God's proclamation? Are you telling me that the Almighty is misleading us or worse still lying? Let God be God and don't tell him what he can or cannot say, be or do. Jesus himself, who never told a lie or sinned, concluded his redemptive ministry in this crystal clear declaration found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. What prophet dare say that? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Millions of Christians call this the Great Commission. Many begin their worship services with, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the question before us, is Jesus God? Let me emphasize that if Jesus was born in the same manner like you and like I am, not supernaturally from a virgin, lived only like ordinary men, died like we all do and did not rise and go to heaven then we have no case for the jury whatsoever he would be thrown out tonight as an imposture but the real question tonight is this was god jesus if we accept the fact that god is almighty and can do anything our dilemma becomes apparent on one hand, we claim God can become anybody because he is not limited in power. Yet on the other hand, we imply he is not all-powerful when we deny him the prerogative to become a man. I submit to you, dear friends, that man can never become God. This is blasphemy. But God can become man and his name is Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Dr. Stanley Jones called the Apostle to India, explained the types of religions in the world. The first, he said, was the Word made Word. God revealing himself primarily in a holy book. The second type is the Word made law. God is used as primarily found in a set of rules. The third is the word made flesh. If humans were libraries, the best way to communicate with them would be through a book. If humans were constitutions and bylaws, they would respond best to a set of laws. Because we are humans, God chose to make the word flesh as we read and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory as the glory of the only begotten son of God for those of you who know the story of Abraham 
let me refresh your memory tonight. God came to Abraham as a man 1,500 years before God came into Bethlehem as a babe. Let us look at Genesis 18, please. I read. Then the Lord appeared to him by the oak trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. Listen carefully. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. They just materialized. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found grace in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. We read in verse 13, And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Later on, as Abraham intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah, we notice that he is speaking to him as one of the men to the Lord. Look at verse 22 and following. Then the men turned away from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, should you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you, you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The last verse in Genesis 18 tells of this human appearance of the great God of the universe. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Pray tell me dear friends, if God Almighty did not choose to limit himself to time and place, space and face, then how could he ever walk away from the presence of Abraham? It states, so the Lord went his way. What shall we say of Melchizedek, who was indeed another appearance of Jesus? For this Melchizedek, Hebrews 7 verse 1, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Adam was a created being from the dust of the earth, and we are dust too, but Jesus was born by the Spirit of God. Mr. Didat, dear friends, in his book, What is His Name, takes great pains to prove that one great characteristic of a true God is he who does not eat at Natu. Well, who are you and who are our primitive tribesmen to tell God what he can or cannot do, say or be? Here in Genesis 18, we are told of three heavenly visitors, the leader addressed by Abraham as Lord, and he stood by them as they ate. Jesus, centuries later, the same friend and Lord of Abraham, ate with his disciples before and after the resurrection because he chose to do so because he is God. Maybe a problem, my dear sir, is although you emphatically announce 40 times a day, God is greater, Allahu Akbar. He is not big enough to perform these smashing, fantastic miracles. How long? I say, how long are you going to keep God distant from us, disinterested in us, dictatorial toward us, we who are made in his own image? The men appeared to Abraham, 
but two left towards Sodom, and one man stayed addressed as the Lord. May I sincerely, systematically, and strongly present you with some of the basic characteristics of God, and let you discover for yourself that in all of these, Jesus does clearly reveal himself to be indeed what we expect God to be. God is omnipresent, present everywhere. In the past, Jesus existed. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. John 17, 5. Well, and majidni anta ayyuhal ab, inda thatika bil majd aladhi kana li indika qabla kawn al alam. Let Mr. Didat try to explain that away and therefore contradict himself and his own words in Birmingham in July when he told the audience, I believe every word of Jesus that is written in the Gospels. Again, in John's Gospel 8, 56 to 58, we read, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. Why I am? If you read Exodus, Chapter 3, verse 13 following, You'll understand why? Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, And say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said to him, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What other prophecy of Micah 5 2, which tells of Bethlehem as the birthplace of the born king, the Messiah, then concludes, whose going forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. Is this a description of a mere man, or indeed of God who condescended to be a man? I quote from John's Gospel, 1724, concerning his existence when the world began. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Let's take note. Now the most familiar passage in John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh. Now in the future, I'd like to say to you, to confirm this truth, listen to the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs 30 verse 4. Listen. Who has ascended to heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you know. Where is the answer? Or what is the answer? Jesus our Lord, 10 centuries later, gave us the answer in John 3.13. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. The Bible states that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. A title reserved only to God. In the last book of the Bible, we are mystified at the revelation in 118. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. First 17 and 18, the same chapter. And when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Do these incredible pronouncements Prophecies and proclamations sound like this supernaturally born Jesus is just a man or truly incarnate deity. God is omniscient, all-knowing. A great number of my learned listeners tonight know the story of the Samaritan woman 
found in John 4. Why was she convinced he was what he told her, the Messiah? He said to her, you want this living water? Go bring your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He looked straight in the eye and said, you spoke the truth. You had five and the one you have now is not your husband. She said, ah! she was terrified ran back to town and what did she say? Come see a man who told me things that I have ever done. Could this be the Christ? And they found he was. The present, some of you may remember the story of Philip. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Only God knows the unknown. How did Jesus see Nathanael when no one else but God saw him, the future. Jesus predicted his betrayal, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection in such minute details that even the disciples themselves, overwhelmed, could not for a while believe him. He also predicted Peter's denial three times, his most faithful follower. He accurately described the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place 37 years later. And in addition to that, he told of the end of the world and the conditions leading up to it, which we right now, tonight, in London and all over the world, are experiencing. Even in what we call the Lord's Supper, Jesus predicted his death for sinners, resurrection, and second coming. Can anyone in clear conscience intellectual honesty and in the pursuit of fairness say after these clear proofs that Jesus was anything but God in flesh even the Quran testifies that Jesus is the only person who knows the hour of judgment Matthew's gospel we are told that the wise men of the East came to Bethlehem you see God is to be worshipped listen to this when they came they asked where is he who is born king? Strange that they call the child king instead of the proper title prince. At any rate, we discover in verse 11 of Matthew 2, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him, not Mary. I encourage you, my dear friend, to recognize that wise men still worship him. The three gifts, gold representing him as king, frankincense representing him as God, myrrh representing him as dying for us as savior. Even demons recognized and worship Jesus. Mark 5, 6, 7 tells us of the story. But when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshiped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, son of the most high God? In Luke 20, 41, we see several facts. Among them, the worship offered Jesus, even by his enemies. Jesus is speaking. And he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son? Now, David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. David, therefore, calls him Lord. How is he then his son? According to the ninth chapter of John, Jesus healed a young man born blind. Then we read in verse 35 through 38, the exciting end of the story. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. 
Let me present your inquisitive minds and seeking hearts with a glimpse of who Jesus is according to Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and following. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the first born from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. God is also omnipotent, all-powerful. Who in the world has power over nature and the elements? You say, of course, God. Then tell me, please. Tell me, please. Who was Jesus when he stilled the storm over Galilee, according to Luke 8, 22? And what about his walking over the water? Mark 6, 45. After that, he's going up to heaven, defying gravitation at the conclusion of his earthly ministry, of redemption according to Acts 1, 4 and following. Elijah was taken up in a chariot, my friends, a chariot of fire. But Jesus went up on his own power because he could do it. Power over life. In Matthew 21, 18, following we read, Jesus had power to annihilate. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, remember he was hungry because he was a man. He chose to be a man. He was a perfect man, a perfect God. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Power over death. The familiar story of raising Lazarus is found in John 11. The body had been in the grave, rotting for days. Yet Jesus called him back to life. Jesus also raised a 12-year-old girl in Mark 5, a teenage boy, Luke 7, and do not forget what he said. He declared, I am the resurrection and the life. John 11:25. Power over Satan and his demons. Luke 8:26 tells a fantastic encounter of Jesus with the demonic world. Then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes, which is opposite Galilee. When he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of of the Most High God. Power of a sickness. The invitation of Jesus is unparalleled in the history of the world. Come unto me, you who are laboring and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He gives sight to the blind, healing to the paralytic, life to the dead. He healed all manner of, of sickness. In Matthew 12, 15, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all power to forgive. Let's read the gospel from which we find the story, both in Mark 2 as well as Matthew 9. You see, they brought this man, could not get in. They lowered him from the ceiling. Jesus saw him and the first thing he said, your sins are forgiven, son. The people murmured in their hearts. He knew what they were saying in their hearts. And what did he say to them? We are told, who can forgive sins but God alone? That was their thought. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of God has power on earth to forgive sins. He forgave the sinful woman. He forgave the thief on the cross. But never once did he ask forgiveness for himself. 
Never once he prayed to forgive his tormentors. Power to create. The prerogative of God is recognized in Jesus when he fed the 5,000, according to Luke 9, from five loaves and two fishes. On another occasion, he fed the 4,000 in Mark 8 from few loaves and fishes. 1 John 5, 20 states profoundly, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ who is the true God and eternal life my dear friends we can honestly can we honestly can we honestly tonight or anytime deny the revealed truth the credentials of Jesus of Nazareth are authentic and overwhelming the prophets of old predicted his coming predictions he faithfully fulfilled in minute details our heavenly father confirmed his relationship to him as his son his miraculous works affirmed his power the holy spirit clarifies this truth to which the apostles and the new testament testify powerfully let me emphasize that god is in reality jesus man gods have been numerous throughout history but this is the first and only true god man jesus the christ yet we ask a very serious question why did christ jesus come if he were a mere prophet the world did not need more prophets priests books or miracle workers the god of heaven gives the answer you will call his name jesus because he will save his people from their sins jesus christ himself came to save you and me from eternal death in hell to eternal life in heaven he loves you as i love you and far more we like to say to you what he declared, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Listen to his declaration. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Since God's word states all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all of us become the object of God's concern. Jesus comes seeking you and me and wanting to give you and me eternal life. The full payment for sin is death. Thus he takes that upon himself. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A secret is revealed when we hear John the Baptist evaluation of Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. How you ask? By substitution he took our place. The first Adam fought the battle and lost. But now the second Adam fought the battle and won. The tragedy of the cross becomes the triumph of the crucified. Why did the ancient Jews have blood sacrifices? Why even the Quran suggests and encourages that? Because without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Isn't it fantastic? God demands good works as a result of salvation, not to obtain salvation. You don't have to go to a holy city, Jerusalem, Varanasi, Mecca, or Rome. They are too small to contain the majesty of God. Ceremonial cleansing can wash the stain, but never a heart full of sin. God is not impressed with our fastings or prayers. These promote self-righteousness. God loves you and wants to save you and me by his grace through faith in jesus christ our lord for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that anyone believing in him should not perish but have everlasting life amen thank you very much We are grateful to Mr. Sharosh for his 49 minutes and 15 seconds. Some impeccable timing. If you want to take a, a deep breath for a moment or two. There's a privilege and one that I did not expect to have and one that I'm delighted to have. Uh, to welcome to the Royal Albert Hall tonight and to listen for the next 50 minutes uh, to the initial presentation from Mr. Ahmed Didat. Thank you, sir.
I would like to have you first. My friend, go on, go on, let you. I love you, brother. I love you. I love you. I love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بل نكذف بالحق إلى الباطل فيدمغه فاذا هو ذاهك ولكم الويل مما تصفون صدق الله صدق الله مرة نزيف Mr. Chairman Respected Speaker and my dear brothers and sisters the subject is Jesus God can very easily be solved by asking a counter question did Jesus claim to be God did he say I am God did he say worship me and believe me Mr. Chairman ladies and gentlemen there is not a single unequivocal statement in any of the 66 books of the Bible or the 73 of, 73 of the Roman Catholics where Jesus says I am God or where he says worship me there isn't I would have been very happy to hear Jesus the, from the lips of Jesus this simple straightforward explicit statement I am God or worship me because I as a Muslim and we Muslims as a whole we believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God we believe in his miraculous birth we believe that he was the Messiah and we believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission this is really the only point of real difference between the Muslim and the Christian is the divinity of Christ and for that I say that our brother has not adduced a single statement from the lips of Jesus saying I am God or worship me while he walked this earth he never made such a statement of course our brother has a chance my brother Shorosh of coming back and perhaps he might be able to point out to me in case he had overlooked it the nearest he came to that was a quotation from the book of Revelation where it is supposed to be the words of Jesus where he says I am Alpha and Omega meaning I am the first and the last now this book of Revelation was a dream was a dream in which John in the dream he saw a vision in which he saw animals with eyes inside and eyes outside and horns with eyes on it all this is a man if he eats too much he gets that type of experiences <laughs> but while Jesus walked this earth we will analyze what he actually said and what he did now the idea of the Holy Trinity in which the Christian, the bulk of Christendom, including the Anglican Church, the Roman Catholics, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists, almost as a whole, they believe in this thing called the Holy Trinity. In the Christian Catechism of the churches, they say, I'm quoting, that the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. But they are not three gods, but one God. He says the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty. But there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It, it continues. I'm quoting the Catechism. He says the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person. But there are not three persons, but one person. I'm asking, what language is that? Is that English? It sounds English, but this is not English. Person, 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 but not three person, but one person. I said, what language is that? What is a person in your language, you English people? Tell me, you Americanized Englishman. Tell me, what is a person in your language? If you and your two other brothers are identical triplets, 
We can't make out the difference between the three of you. You are all identical. If one of you commit murder, I am asking, can we hang the other? You say no. I say, why not? You all look alike. So he tells me, no, he is a different person. What makes him a different person? It is his personality. If the personality is different, he's different. And when you say, the Christian says, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I say you have three distinct mental pictures in your mind. When you say Father, you don't think of the Son. When you say the Son, you don't think of the Holy Ghost, are you? There are, and these three pictures, you can never superimpose and create one. There will ever be three in your mind, unless the mind is diseased. You say these three I see as one. The three will ever remain three. Now, as far as the Muslim is concerned, believing that any human being, any human being is God or is equating with God, it is an act of treason against God. Whether it's a Hindu idea of a God incarnate, or whether it is a Christian idea of a God incarnate, God becoming a man, the Holy Quran says, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرْيَمُ said whosoever says that Jesus Christ the son of Mary is God they are making kufr it's an act of blasphemy it's a treason against God but Christ said Ya Bani Israel O children of Israel La'budullah Worship Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum who is my Lord and your Lord Innahu man yushrik billah whoever will associate anyone with Allah فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ لِلْجَنَّةِ Allah will make Jannat haram for them. Heaven will be forbidden for them. وَمَا وَهْنَارِ And the fire of hell will be that dwelling place. وَمَا لِلْظَالِمِنَ مِنْ أَنْصَارِ And for the wrongdoers there will be no one to help. And Jesus Christ, He is speaking about the Father in heaven. He is your Father and my Father. Again and again, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, if you start taking stock from chapter 1 verse 1, you will come across this phrase, your father, thy father, your father, thy father, 13 times before the first time he says, my father. It's an amazing situation. That 13 times the man is telling you that God Almighty is the father of everybody. Metaphorically, he is the creator, sustainer, evolver, cherisher of everybody. He is the father of everybody, but physically he does not beget. Because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And we were not to attribute such a quality to God, that God begot a son. Though the Christians keep on repeating the words, son of God, son of God, son of God. So he said, what about Adam? He said, how many sons has he got? The bulk of Christendom will tell you one I said, you're not reading your Bible. You don't read your Bible properly. You know, God has got sons by the tons in the Bible. By the tons. You know, tons, the old measurement of weighing things. Tons. Genesis chapter 6 verse 3. It says, and the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them to wife all that they chose. And when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and brought children to them, they became great men of old, old men of renown. In the book of Exodus, God says, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In the book of Jer Jeremiah, says, Ephraim is my son, even my firstborn. In the New Testament, we are told, as many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. Every Tom, Dick and Harry, if you follow the will and plan of God, you are a godly person. In the language of the Jew, in the idiom of the Jew, he says, son of God, meaning a righteous person. But the Christian said, no, 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 Jesus is not like that. He's begotten, not made. So I'm asking, please explain to me. I'm asking the English-speaking people. Please explain to me, what are you trying to emphasize? When you tell me he is begotten, not made, what are you really trying to tell me? And believe me, no Christian in 40 years has been able, able to open his mouth to tell me what it means. It had to be an American, not Brother Sharosh. 
it had to be an American. He said, it means sired by God. I said, what? He said, no, 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 you asked me what it means. I'm only telling you what it means, not that I believe that God sired a son. So, he says, Jesus Christ. I don't know, this to the Muslim is a blasphemy, to say that Jesus is God. But there is another blasphemy from the Christian point of view. You see, the Christian, the Orthodox Christians, the, the Anglican Christians, the Methodists, and all the Roman Catholics, they all believe in the Holy Trinity, and they say that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. You never hear the word is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You'll never hear in the name of the Holy Ghost and the Son and the Father. Never. You'll never hear in the name of the Son and the Holy Ghost and the Father. It must ever be in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. He is always the second person of the Trinity. If anybody in Christendom says that Jesus is the Father, it is a heresy in the Christian church. From the Muslim point of view, attributing divinity to any created being is blasphemy, kufr. But from the Christian point of view, from the church's point of view, Anglican, Methodist, Lutheran and all, if anybody says, has the temerity to say that Jesus is the Father, it is an ancient heresy which was condemned and extirpated by the Roman Catholic Church over a thousand years ago. They got rid of it. Where you say, and our brother Shorosh, my brother Shorosh, I don't know why he hid that fact that he actually believes that Jesus is the Father in his book. The liberated Christian, in case he has forgotten it, he might not have brought it along, I brought it along with me, the liberated Christian. Palestinian. Uh, the liberated Palestine, I beg your pardon. With the Star of David in the background, I don't know, liberated from the Jews or liberated from what? Liberated Christian. He says, I'm quoting from page 80. It's a most loving heavenly father. I thank you for the miracles you have done in my life. The greatest miracle, miracle of all was that you loved me enough to die for me. Who the father died for him. And this is in church history as Master of Divinity, Brother Shorosh will be able to confirm, is an ancient heresy which is called Patripassianism or Monarchianism or Sibelianism. You don't have to worry about these two yard long terms. But this is in church history. It had been extirpated some thousand years ago. But he is the father. But Jesus contradicts this statement. He says, Call no man your father on earth. For there is only one who is your father, which art in heaven. Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. And Jesus is a man on earth, walking this earth, which Peter testifies in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 22. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. Amen. By miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. He didn't do it. God did by him. He was using Jesus. God Almighty was using Jesus. Which God did by him in the midst of you, which you yourself also know. So he is not the father. He says to the Jews, ye have neither heard his voice, the voice of God, at any time, you have not heard the voice of God any time, nor seen his shape or form at any time. The Jews were seeing Jesus and they're listening to him. They didn't hearken to the message, but they were listening to him. They were not deaf, all the Jews. They were reacting to his message. They were listening. They were hearing and they were seeing and they wanted to stone him and he used to get out of the way. He used to run away. He used to hide. They were seeing his form and he used to disappear, not into thin air, but hiding away, running away, according to the Bible. 
So he could not be the father and he could not be that God. The Bible gives us a test. What, what God is not. What God is not. Like in Islam, in the Quran, also we are given. What God is not. Laysak and his shaykh. That God is not like anything you can think or imagine. Anything you think or imagine is not Him. We are given some 99 attributes of God that is kind, is merciful, is just, is holy, and on and on, 99. But there are certain things that He is not this, He is not that, He is not that. The Bible also gives us what God is not. It says in the book of Job, chapter 25, verse 4 to 6, said, how then can man be justified with God? How can you compare any human being with God? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Anyone that is born of a woman is not good enough to be compared with God. Anyone. Whether it's a Moses or a Jesus or a Muhammad, whether it's a Rama or a Krishna or a Buddha, Anyone that a woman carries for nine months can never be your God. That's what the Bible says. When even the moon is not bright and the stars are impure in his sight. In the sight of God. What is all this? This moon, the stars, what is it? Nothing. How much less is man? You see, the Christians are thinking that, look, Jesus is born of a woman, no doubt. But he was born miraculously, which we agree. So that makes him something supernatural because he was born miraculously. So God Almighty, in this book, the Christian Bible, he says, how much less is man? If the sun and the moon and the stars are nothing in his sight, what is man? You and I, what are you, what are we? How much less is man who is but a maggot? You know what's a maggot? You people living in concrete jungles, you don't know what maggot is. You know maggot. I won't describe. You better look up the dictionary, Oxford Dictionary will tell you. Maggot, those worms, you know, that goes on manure, human dung, maggots. You and I, according to this book of God, you are nothing more than a maggot. And the Son of Man, who? Jesus Christ. Explicit statement. In case you have something at the back of your mind, that Jesus is an exception, God Almighty goes out of his way to tell you, look, this Jesus of mine is no exception. And the Son of Man, ask any Christian, who is the Son of Man? Eighty-three times in the New Testament, Jesus Christ is described as the Son of Man. Son of Man, Son of Man, is that the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hasn't got a place to rest his head. And the Son of Man, a sign of Jonah, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, so shall the Son of Man, eighty-three times. Thirteen times his address as the Son of God, thirteen times. But 83 times, 70 more times, son of man, son of man, son of man, and ask any Christian missionary, who is the son of man? He said, Jesus. So God almost and the son of man, who is only a worm. Worm. He's a worm. We are maggots. A worse degree than a worm. He is a worm. In other words, don't make a mistake. Anyone that is born of a woman, and the Bible tells us in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2, verse 21, when he was eight days old, he was circumcised. God getting circumcised? Please, please, we must heed the advice given at the beginning that... There should be no clapping for this. At the end of a talk, if you give an applause, accept it for both parties, please. Thank you. Okay. When he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. Who was in his mother's womb? Jesus. How did he come out from there? Like you and me. Who? Oh, God. I'm asking if you were a nurse, you can imagine any situation. If you were a nurse 2,000 years ago in the stable helping Mary when she's delivering the child, can you for one moment think that that helpless little creature with all the filth and the muck, your God, your Jehovah, your Allah, 
astaghfirullah no the human mind repels the idea that this puny little creature which made his mother impure for 40 days that's what the bible says she had to be purified after 40 days what made her impure the birth of a holy god making her impure no he's a human child like you and me it made mary impure for 40 days says, she carried him for 9 months the anglicans in england today they are a little more reasonable than the evangelists there was a shock survey of anglican bishops in june last year here in in the uk and more than half of england's bishops say christians are not obliged to believe that jesus christ was god no more you don't have to believe if your salvation and mine depended upon that because your salvation if you are a christian the christian believe that jesus must die as a god because one man can't carry the sins of the world if he died on the cross we say they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him we prove the point in july here we will not go into that but the christian must believe that jesus must die as a god and not as a man because one man can't carry the sins of the world So God died. You are asking. You believe that God died? You say He is eternally mortal, and He died. So once He dies, what happens to His creation? You know the power. Power. Where it's coming from? This power that's coming into this hall here, the substation or the head station. If they switch it off there, what can you do with all your switches? Finish. You gone. It's in, you are in darkness. If God Almighty, if His light is extinguished, who runs this universe? who kept it going for three days and three nights he was away in the tomb as the christian the dead for three days and three nights for three days and three nights who was controlling the universe who no no i say jesus christ never claimed at any time i am god or worship me on the contrary he said my father is greater than i He said, "My Father is greater than all." John chapter twenty verse twenty nine. He said, "I can of my own self do nothing." John chapter five verse thirty. He said, "I can do nothing. God can do everything, anything." Ah, except my brother Shorosh was saying that God can become a man. He can do anything. I said, "No, he can't do anything." Am, am I limiting God? I says no. I am telling you, and I challenge people to prove to me that God Almighty, He can create another God. He is uncreated. He can create another uncreated. He is eternal, from the beginning, which has no beginning. Now He can create another, equal to Him. Where? How? As soon as He creates somebody, He is created. that means he can't create an uncreated look this is common sense he can't create another god can he make another father there will be two fathers then he can make a dozen fathers can't he so my hindu cousins are more consistent they believe in millions of god anything is god everything is god he is more consistent he is more reasonable why are you so unreasonable you only make one exception Why shouldn't we have more gods, more sons, physical sons? No, he says, ha, ah, and further, he can't throw me out of his kingdom. This God Almighty, can he throw you out of his kingdom, out of his dominion? Is there a place outside his dominion where he can throw you out? Can he? He can't. Can you imagine him throwing you out? Where, where, where can he throw you out? Ha ah, he can obliterate you yes he can finish you up yes but he can't throw you out of his dominion out of his rule he can't now that doesn't mean he's limited this is how powerful he is his dominion extends over the heavens and the earth everywhere whatever you can think or imagine and beyond so where can he throw you see god almighty does he can do anything but what he does are godly things god must do godly things 
He doesn't do monkey tricks. Look, I don't expect Brother Shorosh to do monkey tricks, nor do you expect me to do monkey tricks here. Do you? A man comes so many thousand miles away from Africa, another brother comes so many thousand miles from America to do monkey tricks here. What do you expect us to do? If somebody told you that, you know, D-Dad and the Shorosh, you know, <laughs> we're having the dance in front of the stage. Would you believe it? Will people believe you? So we don't expect these people, these godly people to come along and do, you know, jiving here. No. God Almighty, He does godly things. He doesn't do ungodly things. He says further, Jesus, He said, I, with the finger of God, cast out devils. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. He says, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. He says, the power, the power we are talking about. He had power to do this and power to do this. He had power to forgive sins. We did get it. Ask him. He says, all power is given unto me. It's not mine. It's given to me by who? By the Father in heaven. God Almighty gave him the power. A general power of attorney. What do you want? I give it to you. And he gave him that power to heal the blind, the lepers, and quicken the dead, and kill those 2,000 pigs, according to the Bible, and drying up the fig tree from its very roots, and stilling the storm. Who, where did he get the power from? From God. So glory to God. And somebody rightly remarked in the New Testament, when he performed a miracle, he said, glory to God for giving such powers unto men. This is it. Glory goes to God for giving such powers unto men, not to the man, to God. Jesus says, my brother says in the Quran, it is said that he knew, he knows the time of the coming of the hour of judgment. I think he has misread the Quran. The Quran is here, he can check it up. I would like to see where he says he knows, or God says he knows. The Bible contradicts that. The Holy Bible. It says, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels, nor neither the Son, but the Father in heaven. In other words, in my knowledge I'm not like God. In my power I'm not like God. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. The big question remains, where does he say I am God, or where he says worship me, or where does he say that I and God Almighty are one and the same thing? Is there a single Christian who can give me a verse that me and God Almighty are one and the same thing? Is there a Christian in this vast audience who can give me? John 14. No, what does it say, John 14? What does it say? That I am... Right. John, no. Uh, the reference is incorrect. No, the reference is not 14.6. The reference is, is, the quotation is right. I and my father are one. The quotation is correct. But it is John chapter 10 verse 30. Please, please, silence, please. The reference is John chapter 10, verse 30. Now, you know, if I ask, you will have the chance to ask questions, my dear brothers. Please sit down. Would you please sit down? I'm sorry, we're going to take questions later. We're not having interruptions now. Please, would you sit down now? Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Didat. Yes, sir. Stewards. I am... Silence, please. I am, I am reading from my head. And my brother Shorosh just confirmed it, that it is John chapter 10, verse 30. Now, the context. You see, in 40 years, for 40 years, I have been talking to people. And when this verse is quoted, that, that Jesus said, I and my Father are one. The verse is there in the Bible. You can't contradict that. I'm asking, what is the context? And believe me, 
In 40 years, I have not come across a single learned man of Christendom, a single man in 40 years, who could give me the context. Yeah, you can open the book, yes, by opening the book. But no man in my life, 40 years now, no Christian with the name could give me the context. You, ha you have to open the book. Without opening the book, you'll never be able to give you the context. Now let me give you the context. You see? The context is verse, starting from verse 23. It says, Jesus walked in Solomon's porch in the temple of Jerusalem. Then came the Jews around about him, means they surrounded him, and said, How long does that make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. They are alleging that he's talking ambiguously. He's not putting forth his claim clear enough. That's a charge, a false charge. Because we know he didn't speak ambiguously. He put forth his claim that he is the Christ, he is the Messiah. But the Jews want to pick up a fight. They didn't like his preaching. Him calling them, you generation of wipers, you whited sepulchres, you wicked and adulterous generation, you fools, you snakes. Would you like to hear people addressing you like that? And the Jews were not a people to forget in a hurry. So, they find the man alone, they surround him, brandishing finger in his face. Come on, tell us. Why don't you tell us? They want to pick up a fight with him, so they can work themselves into a frenzy and give him a good bashing. Get their own back. So Jesus says, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish said, my father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. 28, verse 28. Verse 29, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Verse 30, I and my father are one. In this, to see that once the man has accepted faith, he remains in faith. I as the teacher see to, see to that, as well as God Almighty sees to that. In purpose we are one. But the Jews were looking for trouble. And if you're looking for trouble, you, you don't have to go very far. You get it around the corner. So they picked up stones again to stone him. So Jesus says, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do ye stone me? So they say, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. Kufa. Because that thou being a man makest thyself a god. You are a man, you're claiming to be God. That's another false charge. First false charge was that he was talking ambiguously. Now another false charge that you're claiming to be God. That's the Jews alleged. The Christian agreed with the Jews. They said he did make such a claim, but he was entitled to it. Let us hear what Jesus says. The Jews say he blasphemed. The Christians say he did, but it is no blasphemy because he was entitled to. What does Jesus say? He says, is it not written in your law? Verse 31. Is it, verse 32, is it not written in your law, law means the Torah, I said ye are gods, ye, you are gods. If he, God Almighty, called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, I mean the prophets are called gods in our language, man. The prophets. God Almighty speaks to Moses and he says, behold, I have made you a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. In the book of Psalms, 82nd Psalm, verse 6, it says, Ye are gods, and all of you are the children of the Most High. That's the genius of the Jewish language. That when a person is called God, he is not God. Like in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the Bible says, And the devil is the God of this world. Is he God? The devil, shaitan. No, this is your language. This means he is in control, so you say he is God. Moses is God to Pharaoh, and you Jews are all gods. That is the genius of the Jewish language. Now, you can't say, come for divinity on that. He said, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods. If he called them gods, and the scripture cannot be broken, means you can't contradict me. Say ye of him whom the Father had sanctified and sent into the world, that thou blasphemest, because I said, I'm the son of God. Which is nothing, man. God has got sons by the tons in our community, in our language. Why are you trying to find fault with me when I'm only saying I'm the son of God? When others are called gods. The verse 
statement Brother Shorosh is referred to from my book, what is his name? I took the trouble to give him all my books. All the ammunition I have, I send it to him. He asked for it, I send everything, all that I have written. Everything, all the facts are given in black and white. I said, now you can work from this. It's easier to answer. Once you have it in black and white before you, you know my arguments beforehand. I was not afraid because I know none of these arguments can really be intellectually can be contradicted. Listen, God Almighty says in the Quran now another test is given. Says, Most certainly Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, is no more than an apostle. Many were the messengers that passed away before him. And his mother was a virtuous woman, a saintly woman. And they both had food. So, what's exceptional about that? We all eat food, don't we? No. This is in reference to the idea that they are gods or supernatural. The Roman Catholics call Mary the mother of God. Mary is the mother of God. Jesus is the son of God. And as God, as our brother Shorosh, as well as many Christians believe that he is God in human form. He is God incarnate. So, if they are such godly people, then they both had food. So if they had food, that means they had a call of nature. If you eat, you must look for the toilet sooner or later. Or look for the bush or the rocks. It can't be helped. God Almighty doesn't tell you in those words. But listen to what he says. Unzur. Kaifa nubayjinu lahum ulayati. He says, see how we make our signs clear to you. That they both ate food. The implications of eating food. Unzur. See. How we make our signs clear to you. Summanzur. Have another look. Look. Have another look. How they have deviated from the path. Gone away from the true path. Attributing to God an animal nature. That he is like a man. We are made in his image. What image? This image? This is the monkey image. We are all glorified monkeys. Some look like chimpanzees. Some like baboons. Some like something else. You know? Gorillas. All of us. We are all glorified monkeys. Is that the image God is talking about? <laughs> and the Christian says yes. Christian says yes. I said God said in the book of Genesis, quoted by Dr. Shorosh, he said, and God said, let there be light. I said, did he say that with his mouth? He said, yes. Did he utter the words? He said, yes. So God has got a mouth? He said, yes. So if he's got a mouth, he must have teeth as well. Teeth, teeth. Can you imagine a toothless God, a God with a teeth? <laughs> Can you imagine a God like that? So he says, no, he must have teeth. Yes, he's got teeth. Then I say, he's got a tongue. He said, he's got a tongue. Then he must have a larynx and the lungs. He said, yes. Then he's going to talk, 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 the light, sun, moon, stars, millions of creation. He's talking, 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 his mouth goes dry. So he must need liquid to lubricate. If this type of mouth he has, he must need some lubrication, no? He said, yes. So once that lubrication goes in, there must be an outlet as well, no? Can you imagine? What are you bringing God down to? An anthropomorphic conception. God is like a man. Then talking about plural. God said, he says, Elohim, Im. The first chapter of Genesis, chapter, verse 3 also. Elohim, in Hebrew, Elohim, the God. I said, you know, Elohim is a plural. Yes. My Arab brother says, yes, it's plural. There are two types of plurals in Hebrew and Arabic, which he confirmed, and dual as well. Singular, plural, and dual. Singular, dual, and plural. Yes, Arabic as well as Hebrew. But in, in every Bible, there are a hundred different versions. The word is Elohim, gods. I haven't seen a single Bible yet which says, gods said, let there be light. It should be gods, not God. It's Elohim. It says, what is this? Im. Ask the Jew, ask the Arab. But if it doesn't suit us, we ignore. Im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. 
In Arabic, we have two types of plural, same like Hebrew. When Allah says in the Quran, Inna nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. It is we who have sent down the revelation and it is for us to protect it. Ask any Muslim, the most simplest of us, how many gods are there? He says one. Then who is this us? Who is this we? Ask the Arab. No Arab in 1400 years has pointed a finger at the Muslims telling them that you are worshipping more than one God. When the Quran says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, say he is Allah the one and only, then no Arab questions the Muslim to say, look, who is this we? Who is this us? Why don't you ask us? Why don't you ask your Arab brethren? Who is this we? Who are this us? He says, don't you know? You speak Arabic, Arabic is your language, you know we have two types of plurals, Plural of numbers and plural of respect. This is plural of respect in our language. 1400 years, no Arab has questioned us. I would like Dr. Shorosh to question me. He said, look, there are supposed to be more than one God in the Quran. I'd like to hear that from him. I said, these are two types of plurals. Plural of respect, plural of numbers. This is Hebrew, this is Arabic. So Jesus at Jesus ate, and his mother ate. And the Bible says, the Son of Man came, Son of Man again, Son of Man, Jesus, came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber. This is Jesus, words of Jesus. That this is what the people are saying, that you are a gluttonous eater and a wine bibber. Matthew chapter 11 verse 19 and Luke chapter 7 verse 34. What then makes him God? His birth. He was born without a human father. So he must have a father. So his father is God. The Quran answers that very simply. The similitude of the example of Jesus in the sight of God is like that of Adam. He created him from dust. And he said, be, and he was. So if Jesus is God and the veritable son of God because he had no earthly father, then Adam is a greater God because he had no father and no mother. Simple, basic common sense. Do you stand, stand to reason? If Jesus had no father, that makes him God, then Adam is a greater God, no father, no mother. But ah, he said, you see, Adam was created from dust and Jesus was born to a virgin. Uh-huh. So my brother, he already quoted Melchizedek. Yes, Melchizedek, the high priest of Salem. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 and 3. He says, for this Melchizedek, in the Bible, in your Bible, open it. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 and 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, Salam, Islam, Salam, priest of the most high God, priest without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Who is that? It's God. The only one who is without beginning and end is God. Without father and mother is God. Who lives eternally is God. But he was a high priest and Abraham was giving tithes, taxes, taxes, religious taxes he was giving to this man, Melchizedek. No father, no mother. Jesus had a mother, no father. So Melchizedek is greater than him. Jesus had a beginning in the stable and he had an apparent end. This man, no beginning, no end. Who is greater? Who is greater? Melchizedek. I said, why don't you worship him? He deserves to be worshipped as God Almighty, if at all. This high priest of Salam. Salam. No. I said, stand to reason. This man, Jesus, he cries to God. Supposed to be on the cross. Matthew chapter 20, 27, verse 46. He says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who is he crying to? Himself, putting up an act. Dramatizing himself that he's dying now. He says, oh my God, my God, why you let me down? If he is God, how can he let himself down? 
And again in Mark chapter 15 verse 34, saying, who is he crying to? He's crying to Allah. Allah, 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 Allah. Look, I'm asking the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have them among the Christians. You know, they go and harass people. Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm asking them. When Jesus said, Allah, Allah, Lama Sabahtani, I'm asking, does that sound to you like Jehovah, Jehovah Lama Sabahtani? He says, no. He says, no. So I said, listen again. Allah, Allah, Lama Sabahtani. Does that sound to you like Abba? Abba, Lama Sabahtani? Abba means father in Hebrew. No. Listen. Allah, Allah, Lama Sabahtani in Hebrew. Allah, Allah, Lama Taraktani in Arabic. Sound similar? Yes. Then in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, you read about John the disciple, he saw a vision, and in the vision he heard the angels in heaven singing, Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. And when the Christian goes into ecstasy in my country, they shout, Alleluia, Alleluia. I'm asking, what is Alleluia? He be pray, he be pray. No, no. What is Alleluia? Ya is a vocative and exclamation in Arabic and Hebrew. We begin with an exclamation. We say, Ya Akhi, oh my brother. Ya Ummi, oh my mother. Ya Allah, oh Allah. The Westerner, he ends with an exclamation. He says, stop! S-U-P, stop! Exclamation mark. He says, fire! F-I-R-E, fire! Exclamation mark. That's the Westerner. That's his system. The genius of his language. So, Alaluya is Ya Allah Lu, Ya Allah Lu, Ya Allah Hu, Ya Allah Hu. Oh Allah, you are the only being who deserves worship and praise. Oh Allah, He is Allah. Hu Allah, Hu Allah, La ilaha illallah. He is Allah besides whom there is no other God. Al Malik, the King. Al Quddus, the Holy One. Al Salam, the source of peace and perfection. He is God. Not a child born in the stable to a Jewish girl. What makes him God? I want somebody to tell me, say, look, this is what makes him his birth. I said, that's it. His miracles, he gave life back to Lazarus, we are told. Did he? No. He says, when before calling Lazarus out, you know, he says, oh, my father. He looks up towards heaven. He says, my father, oh, my father, I know that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou hearest me always. Always. Whatever I'm asking, you're giving it to me. You are doing the works. And I know that thou hearest me always, but because of the people that stood by, this superstitious, credulous people, they are going to say that I gave life to the dead. They will say that I am God. For that reason, I am speaking to you loudly. Prior to that, he was groaning in the spirit. Groaning. Jesus wept. Groaning. What groaning? No, he was pouring out his heart to God. My friend Lazarus is dead. Oh my Lord, bring him back from the dead and God Almighty associate him go ahead and ask what you want and you get it so now he's gonna call Lazarus out so he said oh my father I know that thou hast heard me and I know that thou hearest me always but because of the people that stood by I said it loudly audibly that they may believe that thou hast sent me and he says he that is sent is not greater than the one that sent him I can of my own self do nothing the word ye hear are not mine but the Father that sent me, he had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak, even as the Father that said unto me, so I speak. There is not a single and equivocal statement in any version of the Bible where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me. There is not a single explicit statement an equivocal statement, a plain, simple statement. There isn't. If there is, we Muslims would have no hesitation in accepting it. Simply because we know that Jesus Christ, as one of the mightiest messengers of God, he would never lie. The questions being asked, either he was a liar, you know, generally the Christians, he must be a liar or a lunatic or God. Why should you pro make such propositions? Why cannot the man be a mighty messenger of God? Why should he be a liar or a lunatic? Again and again in Christian literature, evangelists, they say either he's a liar or an imposter. Is the oppos opposite of liar, imposter, what is it? God, is the opposite of God, imposter? Is the opposite of God, lunatic? No. What is the antonym for God? Is there? How can you say this or that, this or that? Why can't he be what he claims to be, that he is a messenger of God? And as such, follow him. He says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. 
If you follow me, you will get eternal life. Listen to him, you hearken to him, what he says, what he teaches, and that is salvation. If you don't do that, verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There is no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. And you can't be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments. Listen to him, follow him, and if you follow him, you can't help being a Muslim. Wa dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you very much, Mr. Bida. Now what we're going to do at this point in time is for those, and I realize what a terrible trial it is of, of patience just to hold back when you, you really want to get behind one speaker or another. But I do want to thank you for that patience and for making this debate a debate, and not a confrontation. What we'd like to offer you the chance of doing now is to have your own part in this. Now, it is impossible to offer to five and a half thousand people the right to participate in a debate by uh, leaving your seat in any form. So what we're going to suggest is this. I'm going to be asking the two speakers in just a moment to speak for a maximum of eight minutes each in rebuttal of each other's position. We are then going to take questions. And if there is a question you would like to ask, if you could phrase it as courteously as possible, and if you would write your question on a piece of paper and pass it to your left until it reaches the aisle. And if you are at the last seat right next to the aisle, you'll collect the questions that come from your row hold them in your hand and stewards, when people have had a chance to do, to do that, will you walk down the aisle and collect the questions. Then stewards, you are to bring those questions down to the rear, behind me here, right down to the rear, uh, where you will be met by a box, or by someone holding a box who will collect the questions. They will then be brought in here and drawn impartially. We'll shuffle them up, and uh, if you're fortunate enough to have your question, then that will be asked. We're going to ask you to do that in just one moment. We're going to also say this. Please do not try to leave your seat or come forward. If you want to have a quiet wriggle, now is your opportunity to do it. In about 15 seconds, I'm going to ask Dr. Shirosh to begin his reply. So a moment or two of silence, you can start writing your questions. Please don't leave your seat, just pass them to your left. Have a good wriggle, get rid of uh, any of the cramps or problems that way. <coughs> now may I ask you for silence. Can we have complete quiet? Grateful for your courtesy and for your appreciation and respect of Dr. Shirosh. I'm going to ask him if he would come and make his reply, please, to what Mr. Didat has said. Thank you. What a delightful banshua! And what a joy it is to stand before you and make replies to my friend, Mr. Didat. Concerning the statement about Jesus saying he was God, I first call your attention to John 13, 13. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. 
Remember, please, if the Queen of England walks in here, she does not have to tell you she is the Queen. Jesus did not have to tell you every time he did something, he was God. And when he answered Philip, he said, you say, show us the Father and it's sufficient. I have been with you so long and you don't know? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Our brother quoted another verse which has the same idea. As to our brother's remarks about the book of Revelation, did not the prophet and the prophets have also dreams? Did not God reveal himself to them in dreams and visions? He speaks through visions and dreams. And it does not come because your stomach is full or empty. But God chooses to do so. And if he chooses to do so, it is so. I also like to remind you of something else. As far as the Trinity is concerned, I think the problem with our Muslim friends is that they don't realize we are just as much against the Trinity of the days of the Arab worlds coming into historical position as they are. You see, there was a group of heretics who from paganism came to Christianity and they thought of Mary as the queen of heaven. God married her and Jesus was born. For God's sake, get this through your mind. Jesus was not the son of God as a man who was born through a sexual experience. It is a spiritual title. He came because he loves you. Stop him, Stop him. Be patient to the end, please. The Merriamas, therefore, are just as wrong as others are wrong. Our faith in the Trinity is in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Doesn't it amaze you that in the 99 excellent names of God in the Quran, not one is love, not one is father, and we are not given the idea that God is a dictator and we are to be his slaves, but God is a father who wants you and me and the whole world to be his sons. Please, please. Please, would you hold on to clapping? Don't clap, please. Don't disturb us. How did Miriam conceive of the Holy Spirit? Who is the Holy Spirit? An angel called Gabriel? Let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. And I would urge you to look into the Bible and find out where these sources are. And the blessing of knowing this God who loves you and me. And much like ants trying to go from this point to the other and cannot, you come by. And you say, wait a minute, let me show them the right way. For there is a way that seems right unto man, but the way ends in destruction. So you say, I will help them. You try to show them the way, you push the nose of this one and the tail of the other, but they keep going back to their old way. So you say, I think the only way is either I become an ant or they become human. Now bear in mind that they cannot become human because they don't have the power. And suppose you have the power to become an ant. Now tell me, when you become an ant, can you show them the better way? Can you show them a sirat al the right way? And I answer you by saying, not on your life. Because once you become a man, as a man you become an ant, and once you become an ant, you end up being just like the ants. Therefore, Jesus, God in human flesh, came and he kept the man. He is man. He ate as a man. He slept as a man. He was tired as a man, but he also used the title, the son of man, to identify himself with you and me, for you answer this question for me. How in the world are you going to pay for your sins? How in the world are you going to be justified? Our brother quoted Job, and he misquoted the word. 
the word says very clearly how can a man be justified that means made right in the sight of God and nobody can become right in the sight of God without redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ the Son of God who said I have come that you may have life the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from every sin please remember that when the angel announced the Holy One to Mary that will be born of you will be called the Son listen of the Most High God are you telling me the angel was lying the Lord was making a mistake he loves mystery that he loves you and he pleads with you tonight and says come unto me and I will give you rest come unto me all the ends of the earth and be saved because salvation is not for the Muslims or the Jews or the others it's for all of us God loves us he became a son and as son became man so we as men can become the sons of God because he cares as for the statement my father his self-imposed limitation caused him to say that and I like to say to you when he said I and the father are one he demonstrated that so evidently and remember please God of God and whether the Anglican bishops agree or not let God be true and every man a liar they need to repent of their ways and trust the living word of God and experience revival across this nation and stop wickedness vileness and turn away from the ways to follow the Lord for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet list me a suah hallelujah I invite you one and all to discover the truth which is God in Christ wants to reconcile the world unto himself for a true Muslim will become a true Muslim and a true Christian can become a true Christian when he accepts the gift of God Jesus Christ the son of the living God please remember as far as the wonderful truth of God the term he asked is the word begotten I conclude with a reminder monogenes para patras is the term that's the Greek which is the only son of God of this kind in other words he is the only one of God who came to demonstrate the love of God and no one else Thank you for the joy of being with you. And may the love of God bring us to him who is eternal love, eternal God, and in Christ says, come, I will give you rest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, and now, Mr. Didat. Quiet, please. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Didat will make his reply as well. Thank you, sir. Beginning with John, Chapter 15, verse 30, as quoted by my brother Shorosh, where Jesus is answering Philip, he says, If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Which, by reasoning, the Christian thinks that Jesus is the Father. But if we look at it in its context, again, there are a series of misunderstandings from the very word go chapter 14 begins begins with that misunderstanding and the misunderstanding of the dis disciple continues chapter 14 it says 
Jesus is telling his disciples, and whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. So the disciples say, Master, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? They misunderstood. Jesus was speaking about spiritual journey. They are thinking of geographical locations, like Dundee, Newcastle, where? Southampton. He is talking about God and going to God. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This was too heavy for them. They couldn't follow what he's talking about. So he says, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. It will be enough. Just show us God. We want to see God with our bodily eyes and that will be our satisfaction enough. In answer to that, Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. You are a Jew. As a Jew, you ought to know better than that, that no man can see God and live. God is not seen at any time. And you, being with me for three years, you still haven't understood my mission. You want to see God with your physical eyes when you can't even look at the sun. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Meaning, if you understood me, you would understand what God is. And this is the language he's speaking ever and anon. He says, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. This seeing is not physical seeing. If you understood what I am, you would have understood what God is. You wouldn't make such a silly request. He is not claiming to be the Father. I would like to know, who has heard this verse? For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that? Do you read this in your Bible? Do you? Yes, sir. yes. yes. No, my brother says he does read it. You know, no. you don't read it in the Bible? It's not there? Yes. Sir. It is there. Yes. yes. And amazing there are that. Three words. Yes, yes. For there are three, I'm quoting, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, meaning Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. It's there. In your Bible, sir? Second epistle. Second epistle. Here is the Holy Bible. You see, this verse I quoted you now is to be found in the Roman Catholic version of the Bible. It is to be found in the authorized King James version of the Bible. It's there. But it has now been thrown out of the revised standard version of the Bible as a fabrication. The verse on the Trinity It is thrown out, it is thrown out as a fabrication. All modern translations of the Bible do not have that verse anymore. This is thrown out by, not by Muslim scholars, Jewish scholars or Hindu scholars, but 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. They found that this was a fabrication, and as a fabrication they threw it out. Similarly, 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 the ascension in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You find ascension twice, that Jesus ascended into heaven. Chapter 16, verse 19, and Jesus was taken up into heaven. Luke, chapter 24, verse 51, and Jesus was taken up into heaven. Only two places in the Gospels is the ascension mentioned. My brother quoted from the Acts. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, word, the ascension is mentioned only in two places. And those two places also in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, they have also been thrown out as fabrications. Yeah. <laughs> Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The, 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 the fact that you know, the word Father does not occur in the Holy Quran. Is made a point of. You know, we are given 99 attributes of God Almighty, but Father is not one of them. And Father in Arabic is easier than the word Rabb. You see, Abb in Arabic means Father, 
اب وی ریڈ اگین اڈی ان دی قرآن رب العالمین الحمدللہ رب العالمین رب 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 لارڈ چیریش سسٹینر ایوالو رب نوٹ اب وائی نوٹ بیکوز آف دس میس کنسپشن در آر ملینز آف پیپل آن ارث ہو آر تیکنگ دس تنگ فیزیکلی در دس فادر ان ہیون بی گوٹ ای سن and begetting is an animal act it belongs to the lower animal functions of sex so this word is eschewed is taken out never used simply because there are people like my brother's son <laughs> his brother you have one minute, sir. his son in the book he quotes his son salam salam in the book and salam says that you know after Sh no, my brother Shurush came out of the bath and pulled the plug and the water went out he said now he knows how rain comes about I said how he says you see when Jesus has a bath in heaven and when he pulls the plug you know all the water comes out and we have thunderstorms here and for that the young man was given a hug and a kiss you see now that concept carries on you are having an idea that God Almighty also is there somewhere in the heavens doing something similar so because of this anthropomorphic concepts which are being conveyed in Islam all these attributes where you might have some types of sicknesses creeping in eschew such words these are not befitting the majesty of God that God begets a son or he's the father in heaven the loving father which goes and kills his own son for the sins of mankind he can't rect rectify you your mistakes you commit sin and he kills his own son I'm asking is that love somebody steals you know murders your wife your child rapes your daughter and now you can do nothing you're utterly helpless so what you do you go and kill your own son and you call that love you say now this is the wrong concept of justice and ethics you see if you have the right concept your behavior will come right there was a time in america 60 percent of the people they spoke against premarital pre pre sex but since 1975 you read brother shorosh you know in his book you must buy this book the liberated palestinian he says he is walking with girl on each arm and a sudden bella shh, please a sudden bella bella means a beautiful woman invites shorosh to her house for a weekend and he goes with her to her house for a weekend this is the bible this is the book for, uh, finish uh, for the weekend and the father of the girl is waiting with a gun when he reaches up to the porch is waiting with a gun and doctor makes a, a hasty retreat I said now since then when you are portraying things morality like that what happens is that 61 percent of the people latest statistics in America they are now in favor of premarital sex so I said look I'm told that religion Christianity is not a religion but it is a relationship so we said look without this religion if you don't listen to Jesus he said whosoever look at upon a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart <coughs> see? so my dear brothers mr. chairman ladies and gentlemen uh, I know this is a vast subject and we can carry on endlessly but I respect the chairman's notice that my time has expired thank you very much indeed <laughs> Now we are extremely grateful for your keen interest. Obviously we're all starting to participate in this because we have well over 200 questions. What we're going to do is we're going to pour them, we're going to pour them behind me. Now some of these are going to be written in a language that I'm going to struggle with. And therefore, when that happens, I'm going to pass them to the experts uh, to translate and answer their questions. I'm also going to try to make sure that the questions are as evenly balanced as possible. Now, the first question is, and it's addressed to Mr. Didat, why did Jesus allow Thomas to kneel at his feet and say to him, my Lord and my God, and sir, on these questions, at one minute I will tap you, and at two minutes I will be on my feet. Thank you. Why did Thomas 
And why did Jesus allow Thomas to say, my Lord and my God? Because Thomas, when Jesus went to that upper room for the very first time, Thomas was not there. And Jesus has demonstrated to his disciples that he was the same person eating food, broiled fish and honeycomb. And the disciples testified to Thomas when he comes along and meets them and says, look, the master was here. He had food with us. So Thomas says, except I put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into side, I will not believe that Jesus is physically, he was with us. That he was, if they told him that he was a spirit, a ghost, a spook, he would have believed. Because people believed in spooks and ghosts those days far more readily than anything else. So Jesus, when he comes along the second time to that upper room, Thomas is there and he tells Thomas, reach hither thy hand, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And put your hand into my side and don't be faithless. So Thomas realizes that doubting Thomas that he was, what a heel he was. That all the disciples are testifying that the master was there, that he's alive and he's eating broiled fish and honeycomb and he couldn't believe. He wanted to do this and he wanted to do that. So come on, do it now and see. So he realizes that he was a fool. So he says, my Lord, my God. What? He was calling Jesus his God and Lord? No. This is an exclamation which people do when you are caught out. It's a, my God. It says, Anis, my God, how could you quote me a Quran? You know, this verse is not in the Quran. I say, Anis, my God. Do I mean Anis is my God? No. This is a figure of speech and expression. Thank you. The next question. The next question is prefaced in the name of Allah, did Jesus pray? If so, why does an all-perfect claim by, that's a claim by Christians, the questioner says, why does an all-perfect God need to pray, and to who did Jesus pray? Dr. Shirosh. Beloved friends, how lovely it is to be with you. And I'd like to say to our brother, I trust we will have another occasion to share the same platform together. And perhaps I could even suggest a topic like he suggested the topic. The answer to the question. One of the difficulties apparently some of you are having is your God is too small. God is big enough to come down to say to you, I love you. Can you understand that much? God is love. And as such, he comes in the form of a man, a perfect man at that, conquering every sin, never sinning. And as man representing you, he was praying to the Heavenly Father. Remember, as he was mentioning about while Jesus was on the cross, he was saying, Eli, Eli, Nimashabaktani. I'm sure you recognize he was using the Arabic, but Jesus was not speaking Arabic. He was saying simply, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? And when Jesus died, God does not die. His body died. He forever lives. Please remember that. So he was speaking to the Heavenly Father. Thank you. I'm afraid there are no supplementaries because I'm getting 300 at the same time. So we are going to continue with the next question. Remember... I'm going to, I'm going to ask for quiet. If... I am going to ask for quiet, sir, or you will be ejected from this meeting. If the person to whom the question is addressed does not answer the question, then it is for him a defect and an advantage to his opponent. And therefore, we will not address ourselves to those kind of issues. The next question is for Mr. Didat. A quotation, I and the Father are one. In the Greek, the word one is neuter, denoting one in essence and one in nature, not just one in purpose. Mr. Dinat, would you like to comment? This one in Greek is hen, H-E-N, hen. 
Hen. One. Now, the same word hen is used in John chapter 17, where Jesus is speaking to God Almighty. He says, I am one with you and you with me and the disciples with me. I in thee and thou in me. We are all one. Hen. Same hen. So now, if this one makes one in that bodily form like a sausage, one becomes like a sausage with God, or Jesus becomes one with God as a sausage, because it says this is one means one. Like Adam and Eve, the Bible says that they twain shall be one flesh. One. Sausage? No. In purpose. Same word in Greek, hen. The same word in Greek, hen, for the disciples, of, including Thomas and, and Judas, all of them, we are one with you, I with you, God Almighty, and you with me, we are one with me, and I with, in them, now that oneness, I'm asking, what oneness? Same hen in Greek. Does it mean that they all became a sausage? All the 12 disciples and the traitor Judas and with God and Jesus become a sausage? No. This one is in purpose and not in body or power or omnipotent or omniscience. For Dr. Shirosh, what do you mean by the statement, Jesus is Son of God? The question I want to say with my full respect, do you mean Jesus is direct Son of God, Son of the God, as I am the Son of my Father? Or do you have another meaning? Would you please explain? If you would please remember that it is a spiritual title. God never married anybody. Mm -hmm. God is a triune God. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to urge you to consider that when we say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we see the Trinity 113 times in the Quran, like the Bible says, Bismillah wal ibn wa al qudus We must love one another. We must recognize the truth of God in Christ, reconciling you to himself. Thank you. Mr. Dinat, could you please explain how God could save the world? Could you please explain how God could save the world as the New Testament claims if Jesus was not God coming in the flesh? Let me first correct my brother Shurush about Bismillah Rahman Rahim. You see, Bismillah Rahman Rahim means in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Allah. Allah who is most gracious, most merciful. And he's those God's 99 attributes. That is Allah. He's not 99 gods. He's not three in one. Whereas the Christian formula is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Okay. Three. How does God save the world? That was the question. How does he save? There is only one way. And the way is believe in God and do good deeds. This is what Jesus says. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, most assuredly I'm telling you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you are better than the Jew, there is no heaven for you. That is the way of salvation. Now, Mr. Didat has concluded that comment on a very positive statement. I'm going to throw that same one open to Mr. Shirosh and allow him to conclude on a similar positive statement, albeit a very brief one. Thank you. Once again, I remind you, Jesus never told a lie. Amen. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that anyone believing in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world, that he sacrificed his only begotten Son, that anyone believing in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
when Abraham tried to provide his son, God said, no, I will provide the offering. Amen. And we praise God that tonight we can say for a truth, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three, three in one, mystery, neither you nor I can understand it, but we can accept it like a person. <laughs> I'm going to ask for your quiet for a moment or two. Between one and two thousand people were unable to get in here tonight. And therefore they were reluctantly turned away by the police on the instruction of the authorities here because there was no room. I felt when I heard about this that it must be impossible for a debate of this kind to be carried out between a Christian and a Muslim. I'd like to ask you to thank the speakers. Thank you and good night.